coming this morning. So we're, we're here for uh, to listen to Dr. Norm Groening give his seminar as a part of his six-year review process. Um, and I have to say that one of the fun things about being the person to introduce somebody is you, you get to learn a little bit about their, their history. And I'm like completely envious of Norm. So, so he was uh, raised and then did his uh, associates on the Puget Sound, which is like one of the most beautiful places in the, in the world. Um, and one of the other cool things that I learned about him is that uh, he married his high school sweetheart and they're coming up on their 50th year anniversary. Yeah, so it's been a, a long ride, yeah. Okay, so, so, his, um, so the associate's degree that I mentioned on the Puget Sound, that was from Olympic College. Yes. Um, and then Norm eventually found his way to Eastern Washington near Spokane, and that, that town is called Cheney. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where he got uh, his, both his BA and his master's degree at Eastern Washington. Um, when he went there for his BS, I don't think he had in mind or even knew that research was going to be even a career option for him, but he met a young person there uh, doing research who had an NSF grant, and Norm worked on that grant and it got him hooked. He stayed working with the guy and he did his master's. And then um, during that education, I'm completely envious of this, he got to go to the uh, Michigan Biological Station, which for a limnologist, that's, that's like a dream, right? And that's one of the world famous laboratories, and so Norm got to do work there, as well as another uh, research outpost in Arizona. Yeah, so either uh, Arizona, Arizona State University ran a facility down in Port of, mostly sea turtles, yeah. down in Port of Penasco. Ah, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, from there he found his way to New Mexico State, where he did his PhD, and then after he finished, he came here to A&M, but not into our college, into the College of Science. So, so Norm has actually lived an entire life in the biology department. Uh, both as an assistant and as an, as an associate. Um, and he worked his way through the ranks, was uh, deputy department head for a while. He was in charge of their uh, field certification program for their teachers, and he was also chair of their undergrad curriculum. So th those are all major administrative tasks that Norm was doing before we stole them. I and we stole you in 87, or I think mid 86 or 87, right now. And that was when he finally came to Wildlife and Fisheries, where he's also been involved both in the, uh, research, teaching, and service. Um, and you're also curator of parasites for vertebrates, is, is that correct? Right, and currently you also chair our distance ed program, I believe. Yeah, uh, I'm the chair of that, pro I don't have a distance ed program myself. But yeah, I'm, yeah. Kind of, I'm kind of looking at possibilities of yeah. doing that, but yeah. That. So, um, it's cool, I get to learn all that stuff about them, yeah. So, um, I'm happy to turn the floor over to you and we'll hear what you've been doing. Yeah, I'm probably the only professor at this university that ever served at, at, in terms of the faculty senate from two different colleges. <laughs> so, yeah. when I moved over here, hey, the, they said, well, we got a vacancy. And so, why don't you just take it? So, that's what happened. So, I was <laughs> the faculty senate in other places. Well, this is a difficult task. It's going to get difficult. Uh, <laughs> Because it's really hard to choose something to present that would give you a really true picture of what we do in our laboratory. So some of the things that uh, might help that out is this is our, our website. And Charlene is our webmaster, and she put this together. We showed a lot of nice little critters. And this is all drawings that I've done in terms of some of my publications. And this is a cross-section of a tapeworm. And, uh, these all different kinds of flutes are the best part of the tapeworm on the end. This is a folix from a, a deep sea tapeworm. So, uh, anyway, that's what it looks like. And if you're interested in going to the website, this is where you can find it. Uh, so, um, <coughs> there are my emails there and so forth, but everybody has pretty much access to that. Um, I really appreciate the fact that I'm going to get to give this seminar because. This is one of the only chances that a person gets to let somebody know what you're doing. And maybe that person, another faculty member, become interested in what you're doing, and maybe it could team up and do something collaborative. I have a lot of collaboratives now, but very few of them are here at this university. Most of them are international, so I don't have much going on here, and I would like to uh, very much uh, get some of those started here. Uh, I think everybody has a pretty good feeling about what a parasite is. Uh, I doubt seriously if anybody could give an exact definition right off the cuff, but they know pretty much right. I went on the net and got a little bit of information. Uh, man always tends to, to deal mostly with the things that are most important to him. And so we know a lot about a lot of types of parasitology. Medical parasites, we know a lot about. Uh, humans, for example, are host for over 100 
uh, species of parasites, and that doesn't count arthropod and bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And there's some information, 25 million cases of malaria each year. Uh, probably the, the worst thing up here is this one, with 60 million deaths a year and half of them being children. I mean, this is the east. Parts of Africa today still remain virtually uninhabitable because of parasites. In larger areas, they can't raise domesticated livestock because of parasites are there. So, uh, historically, these things have been pretty important. Um, other ways they're important, anybody own a dog? I have an American collie. That's expensive, folks. And so and that's just something that's important to us. Well, a lot of people that are on ranches and farms still have livestock, and that the vets come in there and vet parasitologists. Uh, and while I've issued parasites, all classes of vertebrates, and many of the invertebrates have parasites that are important, at least to the, to the hosts. And they've been important in history. In fact, uh, what I have over here is a picture of a person that's picked a little pustule where the end of a nematode is present. And these things are the longest nematodes that are found in man. They're kind of wire-like. Uh, it's called Procunculus metanensis. And the way they, you can't take them out surgically, so what they do is they get a stick and they pop this, get a hold of the front end of it, hook it in the end of the stick, and then they wind it up and then tape it to their arm. And then a little while later, they'll wind it up some more and tape it. And eventually, they'll get them out. It's a lot better than surgery. It's a bit like a robin pulling out a worm trying to get it out of the ground. Pull a little bit and wait for it, and then pull a little bit more. And that's the sort of thing that, that, uh, that happens. Well, the reason that I bring this up is kind of in a historical way, because uh, there have been some people working with translations of biblical materials. And the current philosophy is that the fiery serpent of Moses was not a snake, but was this parasite. Because what it does is it erodes the nerve endings and it causes a fiery pain. And so they're pretty sure that there was a mistranslation and this might be the case. Uh, also, you're probably familiar with the medical shield. Uh, originally this thing was designed to show this process. These were not snakes originally, they were actually that nematode being medically removed by winding up on a stick. Okay, you go shooting us on that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one where I'm involved. That they call ecological importance. It's one of these things that, that might be an unsolved mystery, but I'm going to try to shed a little bit of light on the ecological importance of them. I think intuitively most people would, would agree they probably are. Price in 1977 estimated that over 50% of extant species at some stage in their life cycle were parasitic. And again, not counting arthropods and bacteria and so on. Uh, I saw on the net a new estimate that's 80% for that. Uh, so uh, it seems to be growing. Uh, there are only two invertebrate phyla that don't have parasite members among their ranks. And that's the echinoderms, the starfish, and the phenophorus, the cone gill. This is the one that's kind of hard to swallow. Healthy ecosystems always have lots of parasites. Now that's the kind of counterintuitive because you, when you talk about parasites, you think about harm, all kinds of bad things. You don't need to think about them in a good, you know, you inter get introduced at a meeting. I'm Norm Groner, shake hand. I'm a parasitologist. <laughs> and that happens. So anyway, uh, Healthy ecosystems do, and I, I'm hoping that I can shed a little bit of a light on that mystery. I don't know that we can, I can solve it totally, but we sure can talk a little bit about it. Uh, <laughs> actually, just a couple days ago, somebody brought me in a duck, a migratory duck. And he had walked up to it and picked it up in the wild. They let him pick it up. And he was taking it home, and it croaked died. So it brought into me and we opened it up and that's what its intestinal tract looked like. It was completely clogged with tapeworms. Now I can't say that that's what killed them because I see this a lot. There's, this is a common occurrence in a lot of uh, vertebrate hosts uh, and a lot of them don't seem to have any ramifications from having these things present so uh, it's not uncommon. So it may or may not have been the cause of the death, but certainly in terms of being ecologically important, I bet the duck thought it was. So, uh, 
in wildlife fisheries, there's a lot of opportunities in these kinds of things. I had to do that. <laughs> okay, what I, what I chose to do was actually, besides the website, it's like a class, huh? I, I, have a, I have a handout. I thought maybe if you looked at some representative publications from the laboratory, it would give you a better idea of what we do. Uh, there's also a short summary in there about me, and then there's a little short set of publications that we're working on right now in the laboratory to be published. Uh, and so uh, you'll find a lot of uh, the ones that we're working on are actually uh, first authors or students. Uh, I try to, in my laboratory, I like my students to work in research other than what they're doing for their thesis or dissertation. And depending on their contribution, in this case, they're contributing quite a lot. Uh, Decide that what their authorship would be. And I even have one that's an undergraduate in there, Sophia. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about an area that I've done research on as long as I've been in my professional career. Uh, I've done a large number of studies in this. In fact, as right now, I'm finishing up data analysis on a recent study that was kind of a culmination of all of these things because. Uh, there's a certain pattern that keeps repeating in terms of how the, the parasites, the endohelmic parasite of frogs in this case, uh, are, are disseminated within the individual frogs. How, how they're, they're uh, present, which ones are present, what kind of percentages they're present in, and so forth. And that pattern keeps repeating and this new research was kind of intended to take a look at that aspect. Uh, this is a typical uh, scene from a pond. Uh, this is an older picture, but I use it because it shows the students out here doing nothing and the professor over here. <laughs> and I like it too because I ha didn't have gray hair then. <laughs> <laughs> now this is going to take a fair amount of, of explanation. I'll see if I can run this little pointer here. These are basically trophic diagrams, and they're not the pyramid-like trophic diagrams that you see. It's more like if you took the pyramid and put it uh, down, it looked right straight down on top of it. Uh, sort of like a multi-tiered wedding cake, if you will. And uh, generally speaking, uh, it's also sort of like a target, because you'll notice in these things as we get to going through them, you have the environment out here, and the parasites in their larval forms are trying to make their way through host to host to that center part. And that center part then is the bullseye to the middle of this target. Uh, I tried to set these up so I had similar life cycles on each of these. Uh, the first two are, are ones uh, that are found intestinally in the frogs. Uh, Elisostomoides is, and Megalodiscus are unusual as parasites because they don't penetrate into a host and form a medicine carrier. They actually will have the, the stage on the outside of the host. They'll insist on the outside. So if you, if you look at these, these uh, diagrams, uh, basically the eggs get deposited from the feces of the host out in the environment somewhere in the debris. And when you see an arrow like this, just the tip of the arrow, it just means that this thing is release the mericidium or whatever larval stage is present to. So it's hatched in this case. And in case of both of these guys, uh, both of them will uh, have a swimming stage, the mericidium, that will go on and penetrate certain species of snail. And this is Helizoma, a pretty common one that we have locally. And this mericidium is a single individual, and it will go inside there and become the first germinal mass in asexual reproduction that occurs in this snail. And so it then transforms into a kind of a ball-like structure, a sac-like structure. On the inside of that, there's a germinal layer, and it'll bud off a new generation. So one, all of a sudden, produces many. And then those new generations will do the same thing, and provide other generations. And this will go on until you have quite a number of these things, but the last series, the last generation will be a swimming or crawling stage that's going to leave that snake. And that's going to be uh, the Sicaria. And in these, the Sicaria will, well, we can follow some of these things, 
uh, they, they'll take off and they may be found on the surface, say, of a tadpole where they form this resistant stage, the metasicaria. It's infective to the final host, so if a tadpole gets eaten by a frog up here, that's how it gets exposed to it. It'll become an adult there. Uh, they may also uh, do an interesting thing. They may form a, a metasicaria on the outside of a small frog, or it might even be on a large frog. And when it does that, frogs oftentimes shed their outer core, their, their skin. And when they do that, they oftentimes will eat it. And so they will auto-infect themselves by eating these skins that have the medicine carrier on. And in addition to that, obviously, if a small frog gets eaten by a big frog and has the medicine carrier on it, uh, the adult can be achieved that way. And they go on a lot of things. Prairie fish. Now, in this diagram, sometimes you'll see crossovers from one trophic level to another. In other words, we have the external environment. Then we have the, the herbivore level with the snail and so forth. Some of the smaller crayfish, uh, certain species, uh, are herbivores when they're young. And as they grow up, they become more carn carnivorous. So they kind of participate in two different trophic levels here. So that's what I tried to reflect here. And then we have the next level here with odonates and that sort of thing on it. And then the center of the target, which then is, the, is the, uh, where the adults are achieved. Then and, uh, so anyway, these two are extra. I remember Ellis Timotius, because I'm going to bring it up just uh, again a little bit later. These have similar life cycles as well. Uh, Hematolicus brevoplexus is found in bullfrogs. Uh, it's, all, it's, it's specific to them. Hematolicus coloradensis, on the other hand, is found in leopard frogs, and it's specific to leopard frogs. They're lung parasites. They're found in the lungs. Lipthalmans quieta is a parasite of the intestinal tract and is found in, in both of these frogs. Uh, again, if we look at this thing, we have an egg in this case that's present and it's going to get ingested. And the one that ingests it here is Farissa. And Farissa is a, like a limpet kind of a snail. It's a Chinese hat looking thing. Uh, it's uh, inside of this mollusk we're going to get that polyembryo and again we're going to get those generations produced. And it's going to end up again, like it always does, in this stage, the cicaria that's going to leave it. And when it does that, it'll seek out uh, other places to go. And so, in the case of Madelicus brevoplexus, it goes only through this mollusk and host. Uh, brevoplexus only goes through certain species. It's very specific to the odonate it'll go in, and they're only dragonflies. So, it'll go in and penetrate inside, not on the outside, but inside, and it'll become then a, a medicine carry in the flesh. And so when this larger frog eats that odonate, it's going to become an, uh, exposed and ultimately adult will be produced there. Um, in terms of the second species, Colorado Exus is found in the leper frog lungs. Uh, it uses spice. And it does the same thing. It's going to go through that same process of generation production there uh, in the physic snail. And then the cicaria is going to uh, come out and it's going to go to odonates again. But in this particular species, any odonate will do. It doesn't matter whether it's a damsel fly or a dragon fly. For some reason, this thing is much less uh, specific to that particular host. And in addition to that, I didn't, didn't really show it on this diagram, if that odonate is a larvae and a nymph in the water, okay, if it metamorphoses through, it carries that medicine carrier with it. And so, as an adult flying around the pond, if a frog should eat it, it can become infected. So it's a little different life cycle uh, than the other. Okay, uh, and glyphthalans is an internal parasite. It's a fluke. Uh, in this particular case, it also goes through physa, does that same polyembryony generation production, and it can form metasicaria in the skin of small frogs, large frogs, if a big frog eats an infected little frog, it becomes exposed. And again, you can have auto-infection here as well uh, when they eat their own shed skin because these, uh, the skin is where we find these medicines very incredible. Okay, uh, this looks really kind of atrocious, but I can't help it. These, these guys have a lot more pathways to get where they're going. Uh, the strategy they use is just a little bit different. Now, having said that, you'll notice that Helopagus here is found in two different species of snake. Uh, that's really unusual. 
uh, does have. Uh, I kind of think that these are probably two different species. Uh, and I think one's probably specific to the bullfrog and one's to the leopard frog. But the morphology is identical. So this is going to be something a molecular biologist sometimes is going to have to work out to, to determine that. But at any rate, we, we have a situation where the eggs get ingested, the germinal masses produce the different generations of Sicaria leaves. And that Sicaria will go uh, into uh, uh, adults. As, as a, it'll go into the helizone as a, as a metasicaria. When the snail eats the metasicaria uh, in that snail, uh, it becomes uh, an adult. Uh, one interesting thing that happens with the second one or with, well, with Helipagus itself, is that if the tadpole takes this in, it forms a mesosicaria, which is an active individual. It doesn't form a cyst-like structure. And when this thing metamorphoses through as a small frog, it becomes an adult in the eustachian tube. It's an eustachian tube parasite. Uh, so Helipagus uh, has a variety of ways to get through this mess in, in order to become a, an adult. Gorgadera goes through a spirit clamp, and it again takes in the, the mericidium. The mericidium then goes through the same kind of generation building that we saw on the other. And uh, this then, the Sicaria comes out. It can be found uh, in crayfish. It can be found in other snails, a variety of things, which ultimately then is going to get eaten by the frog and uh, produce the adult. Uh, these are similar life cycles that are composed of mostly nematodes. Rhabdius is another lung parasite. It's found associated with uh, the, the inner parts of the lung uh, in both of these frogs. Uh, it's a nematode. Chondrocercoides, Spiridotectus, Camelanus, they're all nematodes, but they're intestinal. Uh, Gyronicola is found only in tadpoles. It's the only adult we find in tadpoles. And we only find it in the older tadpoles because at first they don't feed when they when they when they first come out into the out of the egg. And so for a while it takes them before they start feeding and start picking up uh, these kinds of parasites and ingestion. Uh, Ophitinia, in that case, so these are tapeworms, and there are two species actually that we see of this. But at any rate the, the Ophitinians uh, will have eggs. The eggs are eaten by a copepod. It produces the first uh, stage of the larval system. Uh, it's called a procercoid. That's eaten by a tadpole. It becomes a pluricercoid, a more advanced larva that will become the adult. And when the tadpole is eaten, uh, it will become the adult and the frog. Uh, Spinotectus goes through maize flies. And, and generally speaking, this is the same kind of orientation that we saw before. Now, the interesting thing to me here is the fact that we're talking about just those parasites that are found as adults uh, in frogs, two species of frogs. But if you put them all together, it's spelled mother. <laughs> so, and back to the question that in a healthy trophic system, you have a lot of parasites. They're dependent on the trophic structure to get from one place to another in most cases. And so what eats what's very important. So the more linkages there are in that trophic structure, which is kind of the way we define health in the trophic system, uh, the more parasites you're likely to have. Because that's how they make their living. Now it gets a little worse in that frogs also serve as intermediate hosts for parasites to go through things like birds, turtles, snakes, a variety of things. So if we do the same kind of thing and look at that kind of a system. Now we have an extra trophic level, and that's where we find the, the final host is a bird or whatever it's going to be. And our uh, frog, now the large frog, is an intermediate host in the trophic level right below. And it's the same sort of thing. All these things that Cephalodonus vesicatus is, is found in turtles. It's an internal uh, intestinal parrot. Clonostum is unusual. You don't see it much, but it does occur. Clonostum is actually found mostly in fish as a, as a larval state. We call it the yellow grub. If you've ever been fishing and seen these big yellow things, that's the yellow. But we find it also in the frog. Uh, Macroscurts, uh, sequoides, and paramacrocycloides, those are found in fishes. Uh, these are all snake parasites here. Uh, 
Uh, cheap orchids are primarily turtles, and Charlene is working on, on some of those, and, and so on down, on down the line. So again, still we're talking about only those species of parasites that we find in these two species of frogs. In that environment, in those ponds, there's lots of other critters. Lots and lots of vertebrates that serve as hosts have their parasite, and lots and lots of invertebrates that have their parasite. So, are they important? Well, I, I tend to think they are just based on the sheer volume that we see in these trophic structures. I want to choose just one and talk about the life cycle. So I'm going to repeat the life cycle a little bit. Uh, this is a, a leopard frog, and the parasite that I want to talk about here is one of those lung flukes. It's hematolecus. Coloradensis is the one we find in the leopard frog. And in a, just a general way, the eggs come out of the environment, eaten by the snail. This becomes the first stage of polyembryony, develops all those different generations. A swimming stage leaves, goes into an odonate. Now remember this guy, this particular parasite goes through just about all the odonates. It doesn't matter whether it's a damselfly or a dragonfly. I probably should have put a line here because most of the infections probably occur from eating these larvae that are infected. But some do metamorphose through and if they're eaten they can also uh, be a source for infection. So that's the basic life cycle no. of this guy. How do they enter the odonates? Do they eat them or do they they penetrate in. I'll, I'll show you a picture of one here in a minute, and I'll show you exactly the mechanism for that. Uh, but they actually dig a hole in them. They have a stylet-like structure that allows them to do that. Uh, and the stylet, uh, you can tell whether or not it's a soft-bodied uh, animal that's going to penetrate, or if it's a hard-bodied animal based on the way the stylet is set up. So uh, they're characteristically different. Now what I did was I I took some pictures of frogs and so forth. This is the leopard frog. I don't know what the species of this is because our illustrious, no veterinarians here, is there? <laughs> our vet school, when they used to teach their, they used frogs out there. When they were done with them, they, they came from a supply house in Carolina and they'd let them go out here. So I don't, I'm not exactly sure what we do have, have in the area. But these are, are the leopard frogs. And what I did was I took the lungs out, I turned them inside out uh, on a forceps. So you can see the parasites. And these are pretty good sized little flukes. And I made no attempt to put the flukes on one side. There are just as many on the other side as well. So these things are, are quite large and they're found here in the lung. Uh, this is one that I just made a slide of. It's been stained with, with specific kinds of stains. The reds are reproductive organs, the dark parts are the eggs that these things produce. Lots of eggs in these kinds of parasites they have a very high reproductive potential. Now, this is the adult, uh, this is Brevo plexus, the other one, but uh, this is the adult uh, we were talking about, and just basically it has two suckers, uh, one around the mouth. It has what is a cecal system, sometimes you'll see it called an intestine, but it's not intestinal, it's absorptive and secreting, it's just surface area for those purposes. Uh, testes are one above the other, what we call tandem, the ovaries above that, uh, this coil structure, that's where the eggs are deposited, it's the uterus of the individual, and this is the, the uh, male system that comes into it up there as well. Uh, these little clusters of stuff are vitellaria, they actually produce milk material that becomes part of the, uh, becomes part of the egg and the, to surround the larvae for feeding purposes. So this is a typical flu. Uh, interestingly enough, this is the verbal plexus. Remember, there's a difference in their affinities to that second host, that ovnate host. Well, I've always been convinced that they'll represent two different genera. And nobody would buy that, but they just now came out with a study that shows molecularly that they are. So morphology was correct to start with, but it took a little bit of molecular before they could actually figure that out. These are the eggs. The eggs are produced, they come up out of the lungs and the intestinal tract, they go out into the ecosystem and the feces. They're percolated, they have that, a, a stage within them, which is the first larval stage, that's that mericidium that we talked about earlier. Uh, when this thing is ingested, it'll come out of that egg, it'll penetrate into, these are penetration glands here, and they'll actually wise the, the intestinal tract of, of the snail and get into the tissues 
and become that first germinal mass. Uh, I didn't mean for this to happen, but this is really interesting. I didn't notice this until the other day. Uh, this is the snail host where all this occurs. Remember Elasimodes that I talked about earlier? The one that is on the outside of his host? That's what that is. It just happened to be the picture that I took had that thing on it, and so here's one of those metasecaria there. But this is the snail host of this particular species in its bison. Uh, the last generation of all the generations is, is the secaria. It's basically an immature individual with a tail, so it swims through the water when it leaves the snail. Uh, I'll show you a blow-up to answer the earlier question. This is the secaria. Uh, Brickoplexus is a little bit smaller, but Colorado Ensis has up here, as all the video secaria do have, a stylet-like structure. And that's the style like structure right there. And also it has these penetration glands. It doesn't have any adult morphology, no reproductive glands or anything like that. But these things then will attach to the surface of that host. The next host will be that odinate. And these things are muscular, muscular control. And they'll secrete <laughs> these enzymes to soften things up. And they'll use that muscular control style to peck a hole in the individual. They'll crawl in, drop the tail, They'll round up and form a cyst in the flesh. And, of course, this would be the old mix that we find this in. Now, um, if you remember, this particular species goes through a lot of different old names. And when we were doing, when I was doing the data collection on these, I needed to be able to separate species. And it turns out there's not a whole lot of information around for our area where they know which one of these larvae go with which one of the adults. And so what I had to do is metamorphose these things through to get adults so I could figure out what they were. And this is little Lula. This is Anax. Uh, this is Tramia. And if you'll remember, they also go through odonates, and the major one is Ananagma uh, here locally. And this is our medicine carrier here. It's just in the tissues of, of, of the old mate host. Uh, when this thing, when a frog eats one of these old mates, it digests out these cysts. And these cysts exit. They'll pop out of them. And they'll look a bit like this. They'll have start to have reproductive organs, but no eggs or anything like that. And so they'll be kind of an immature form that's going to wander around in, inside a, of that frog host until they find the lungs, and then they'll become adults there. Now, this could take some explain. Uh, what I did was I, you may, well, most of you are probably familiar with the old textbook by Odom. Well, he's got these wonderful uh, flow diagrams that shows energy flow uh, in the uh, trophic systems. And I stole them and did it with numbers in my parasite. And a lot of this is based, for example, the number of eggs and stuff on laboratory experimentation, some of it's field observation, some of it's a little bit of both to get these numbers. So basically, there's the first host, the snail, the odinate host, and the frog host. And the thing that infects this host, of course, is that egg that it ingests. Well, it turns out this is done on the basis of per meter cube of uh, pond. And the reason I did that was that's what somebody told me was the best thing to use, but um, obviously we can use other things as well. But anyway, about 86,000 eggs are produced per meter, per meter, meter not per cubic meter of pond. Uh, these gray boxes in the back here are estimates of the host population sizes, 6.6 uh, snails per commuter. And this is not for entire years. You'll see in a little bit. This is only like about six months because these things are very seasonal. They occur only at certain times of year when the parasite's active in the system. Uh, there's a lot of time of the year that they're not. But the eggs are present. And what we actually achieve is about 8.4 of these eggs successfully infecting the snake. And so look at the waste that we see here. Also, the nice thing about this is that polyembryony we talked about. 
it recoups, the parasite's going to recoup a lot of that, and it's going to get up to the point where about 2,800 of these Sicaria are going to be produced. And so it kind of bumps it up. And this is a really cool critter to do this with. This is the herbivore. Uh, and when I took uh, ecology when I was younger, uh, they talked about eating uh, low on the, the food chain. Uh, or, uh, sort of like you do uh, China. Rather than feed rice to a cow and then you eat the cow like we would do here, uh, they'll eat the rice. And so you don't lose as much energy between steps. Well, this thing uses the energy. It's a parasite. It don't care if it wastes all this stuff. It's got all this energy to deal from from this herbivore host, and that drives the reproduction. So the asexual reproduction gives us this number of sicaria to go into the next level. And if you go out and look, you'll find only about three of these that are sicaria per meter cubed of pond during this activity time. And uh, so again, we have a, quite a large waste here. Now, they don't feed as a medicine carrier. So everything's being driven by what was stored here at that point. When the odonate then is eaten, we achieve only about 0.06 new individual per meter cubed to pond. Uh, and uh, so again, we have a relatively large amount of waste. Now I have, I have this for bullfrogs, I have it for a number of other critters as well, but this serves as a, a good example, I think, to, to show this. Now, I said it was seasonal, and you can see, if you look at the, this is temperature. Uh, this then is the area of time that we don't see much activity. And these things peak, the adults peak. Uh, and this is a two-year study. And it's kind of interesting because you get your top point down here in the snails, and, and your top point in the old nicks, and your top point in the adults are kind of staggered. And that, that always happens in, in all the diagrams I've done. So uh, that's a commonality, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. And this is numbers. Uh, I didn't do snails because it's impossible to count all those masses and, and so forth. So, uh, but I did do the old and the frog. Now, I prepared this from the data that I'm now looking at in this latest study. And uh, I did it specifically, I have a limited amount of information here, but I, I wanted to show you a little bit about this, this uh, uh, business of having a kind of a pattern for the adults. And so here we have the, the stars represent the adults, and that's the number of species. And these are the different size categories of frogs that I use. Uh, I just divided them up into nice sets. I didn't make, there's no biological reason for that. I also have the, the tadpoles over here in this study. And uh, these little balls here represent larval forms versus adults. And again, that's the number of species. And the X's are basically kind of an estimate of, of the total numbers. But the thing that, I, that, that shows up in every study is that the parasite populations in the adults, in particular in all of them, start to climb after they metamorphose and the small frog kind of peek out in the medium-sized frogs and then dive off in the large frogs. In fact, as I do have some that are over a pound frog, but not very many of them, uh, and they're virtually zero. And the question that I was concerned with was, well, how in the world does this happen? Is there some kind of a immunological thing going on here? Is it? Uh, age resistance, is it something ecological? And so that's what this newest study was trying to do, along with actually assaying these things for the number of species and also the prevalences and their intensities and stuff like that. Uh, I did food analysis of it. <laughs> but I, if I, I was <laughs> really floored because I, what I started out doing was the same thing that they do and bullfrogs, and this is bullfrog, uh, have been analyzed for what they a lot. And what they do is they list the, the, the classificational levels, the different taxa, and say, well, this percent of the, was this tax, and this percent was that tax, and so forth. And it's misleading, and I'll tell you why, because the frogs don't care what the tax is they're eating. The frogs care how big they are. If you're a little frog, 
you got a small mouth, you eat little things. And if you a medium-sized frog, you eat a little bit bigger thing. And if you're a big frog, you eat mostly crayfish of all things. Big crayfish. I found uh, bird feathers, never birds. I found small turtles in them. Uh, I found uh, uh, some things I couldn't identify them. But uh, mostly, these, those big frogs are eating crayfish. Allosostomoides, crayfish, outside. These have heavy burdens of allosomoides because it also goes on smaller food items on the outside, and they eat. As they get into bigger ones, they start losing that parasite, and then when they get into these great big things, they're back to having something that it's on the surface of, and so the parasite populations for allosostomoides grow again. So to me it looks as if, and again I need to finish analyzing this data, that over time, as these things grow, their food preferences are changing. So that it not only changes the number of species present, it also changes the complexion of what species are present. And so it makes a nice little picture. Now, I'm really anxious to quit doing this kind of stuff and go back and work on this stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have a, a more current study, but it may be that that's not a, a good thing to do. It's about cyclocelids that we're having trouble with in zoos and things like that. So I'm going to stop there. So if there's any questions, I can, can entertain. Okay. Questions for Norm? So the, the food web part of this is really intriguing. Uh, so there's a guy, Lafferty, is it Kevin Lafferty? Yeah. Kevin that studies uh, parasites and food webs. Mm -hmm. And he claims food webs are dominated by parasites, as, as you demonstrate. And so, yes, that's a natural, healthy, biodiverse system that makes sense. But what would the ramification be for eliminating Parasites, like for example, we eliminate mosquitoes because they cause disease. You're taking a an well, annoying component for us out of the system. Is there a cascade of effects? Um, here's what here's what happens to the energy that comes out of like the snails. Uh, they quit reproducing. Their their reproduction rates drop dramatically if they're parasitized. But not all of them are parasitized. These uh, parasites allocate the resource really nicely. They don't over overuse their resources. They're very good at this. It's two eons of time, obviously. But it, it, it's not going to. If we were to remove the parasites, I, I don't think it would have much effect uh, because they're certainly uh, are pretty attuned to their host, and they don't really do a great deal of harm to it that we can visibly see. But they're draining energy. Right. So and what, what that would do it, to the whole population, it seems like the whole population uh, certainly would benefit from the loss of, of the energy, but I don't know if that's a good thing. Well, but think of a frog loaded with lung flu. I mean, that's got to have some kind of a drag on the fitness of the frog. You'd be it, amazed at what these things, what they can tolerate. It's well, they tolerate it, obviously, but um, are they a little bit slower? and maybe less able to escape their predators, yeah. like raccoons or whatever. Yeah. It, they, well, there's a, for example, uh, there's a tapeworm that uh, goes in coyotes, and it has a, a, a big bursate cyst that forms in the flesh. And in the rabbit intermediate host, it has a predilection for the joints of the hips. So those that have it can't run as fast. And so as a consequence, it's easier for the coyote to catch them. So that's a cascade of, of influences on the trophic interactions of the web. It, it must occur. It does. I mean, with these I'm, kinds I'm sure of it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's so difficult to, to nail down any real repercussions of these things. But they do definitely drain energy. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I know there was a recent study, I think it came out this year, maybe really late last year, about like all that lost biomass with the eggs and the larvae and stuff, and it going into organisms that use it just for nutrition, mm -hmm. that the parasites can't actually parasitize. Um, so it could be like 
fish or other crayfish species or something else are actually using it as nutrition instead, but they're right. just not in this example exactly. since it's a life cycle for the parasite. But food restore. Yeah. It's a lot of copepods and amphipods that like to eat parasites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might as well, I wasn't going to show this dog. A lot of times when I go to meetings when there's not just parasitologists at mixed meetings, this discussion topic comes up that parasites are just little carnivores. And most parasitologists don't agree with that. Certainly they're little, they're on or in a host, that sort of thing. You can like this. Uh, I haven't updated this at all. It's, it's an older diagram. But I presented this at a meeting one time just for, because uh, uh, what I did decided to do is not fight. I was going to tell them, okay, uh, well, if I agree with you, and these are really just carnivores, if we look at the trophic structure of this thing, who's the top carnivore? First, parasites. All these guys have got parasites. Every category has parasites. And so in terms of energy flow, wouldn't that be the top five? I've had more requests <laughs> for this from parasitologists and non-parasitologists who want to use some adaptation of it teaching their courses. It's, it, it's been amazing. They also can alter behavior, so they can create... Uh, in some cases, yes. Yeah, they can have right. a lot of like bioengineering type effects by changing like the behaviors of different hosts. Host altered behavior. Yeah. Right. Which is going to affect the food web. Mm -hmm. There was a guy at the University of Michigan that worked on behavior of snail, and he had these big grids out in the bottom of the lake, and he brought his scooby gear, and he'd take out, he'd mark them with dots so he knew what snail was what. And he'd take and fill that, that uh, big petri dish up, he set it in the middle of the grid, and then he'd come back and so often he'd track his snails. And, so, and he couldn't figure out why these certain snails kept going left and certain ones went right. And he just, so he had us look at the snails, and it turns out that, I don't remember what direction it was, but the parasitized were going one direction, <laughs> and the non-parasitized were going the other. Now, I have no clue why that was, but it definitely was the case. Maybe photo or something like that. <laughs> So in um, planarial nematodes and in um, entomopathogenic nematodes, there's some associations with bacteria that allow them to... Yeah, and fungi too. Yeah, so any idea whether any of these models? No, I, I didn't notice that with any of these at all. Uh, that, that uh, I didn't really go out of my way to look for them. But you don't see them? I, I didn't see any of them. So the terrestrial systems, is the whole flux of energy or loss to parasites less in terrestrial than aquatic systems simply because of the medium? Not really. Not really. The, well, the other thing I was going to talk about has a terrestrial system. There's a terrestrial system. They look at the terrestrial snails. And it, they're, I don't know how to phrase it, but they're killing the snot out of all the birds and the weeds and stuff. Just all of, out of the blue. Right. For some when, they, when, the, when they put these aviaries together, they want to make it just as much like home for those birds as they could. So they, well, apparently all these zoos worldwide, they had the same distributor for, for vegetation. And then with it came the right snail. Yeah. And so they bring in, it's hard to, to diagnose or to detect these parasites that I was going to talk about because they're in the, the infraorbital sinuses and lungs and stuff like that. And it's, they miss them when they try to detect them. And when if they do catch them, uh, the intestinal treatments don't work. And so they'll accidentally re release one of these birds that's got a real small infection. And in these enclosures, all of a sudden, all the birds are getting it. And they're getting a horrible, horrible infections. You just want to show us horrible, horrible. <laughs> 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 Go on. <Yeah. laughs> no, man, it, it's really... Not the day off of diving. <laughs> I do, I get the same. This is a laparoscopic view. What they're doing is they're trying to use this tool to pick these guys out of the lung. And uh, it, you can biologically, uh, you can, let's say, significantly reduce the numbers in here, but it doesn't help. I and mean, these things are loaded with, with mm -hmm. parasites. Uh, one of the things, this is a, 
uh, in this x-ray, all these little white things that are down there, those are all parasites, all flukes. And these are quite big. These things are like three inches long. Hmm. And uh, they, uh, they, <laughs> they're really problematic because in nature, you don't have large numbers of these birds. In fact, there's only a, a small number of birds are infected with them. Right. But you put them in these circumstances, and they're so close proximities, uh, there's lots of infections. Well, almost all the descriptions of species of cyclocelids, these flukes, were done uh, based on one or two specimens because there aren't very many. Right. And so we get the impression that, well, they're very specific to this bird and that bird, they're not. They'll go, there, there are sparrow-like birds getting this thing in these areas. Uh, bluebirds, for example, woodpeckers are getting them. Uh, apparently, they must be, uh, and this is kind of one of the mysteries, is, is uh, you wouldn't see a, a woodpecker eating a snail, right? I wouldn't think. But apparently, the moisture attracts them or something, and they'll pick them apart and pick up the parasites. How do you like this <laughs> More questions for Norm? All right, let's thank him again.